the alarm interrupted my sleep. Stretching out my hand, I found and pressed the button and the persistent sound stopped. The clock showed 8 a.m. I allowed myself to lie in bed a little longer, slowly waking up from sleep before I struggled to get out of bed. I went to the bathroom, freshened up with water, and then headed to the kitchen to prepare breakfast. Turning on the TV, I chose a channel with morning news, which now served as a background to my morning ritual. On the screen, a beautiful presenter was reviewing the latest news. First, she briefly touched on the activities of the city's mayor, but it did not catch my attention, so I only glanced at the change of topic. The next report was more interesting. Researchers from the Meteorological Center discovered an unusual temperature anomaly in Antarctica. They suggested it might be volcanic activity, but they were not completely sure. The U.S. government, in collaboration with the military, plans to send an exploratory mission to find out the reasons behind this. The presenter smiled, emphasizing that the mystery might soon be unveiled, which could particularly interest fans of Lovecraft's works. Hearing the news, I could not hide my surprise. It had not even been a week since we discovered the anomaly by studying temperature maps of Antarctica using satellite data. Our report sent to the government sparked lively interest, and it was decided to organize a research mission, of which I was to be a part. Yesterday, I received an email indicating the meeting place with the mission team, scheduled for today. Reflecting on what was to come, I finished my breakfast, quickly dressed, and, looking at the clock, realized that I needed to hurry. Gathering the necessary items, I headed to the address indicated in the email. Leaving the house, I headed to the nearest subway station, where I easily found the right train, which was overcrowded. After making my way to the station near the government office, I exited the subway and started ascending the stairs outside. At that moment, a woman appeared before me unexpectedly. Her appearance and attire evoked thoughts of a gypsy, dark hair tied up in a voluminous bun, and her clothing bright and colorful, adorned with many patterns and fringes, clearly stood out against the gray city hustle. Looking at me with her piercing large eyes, she offered to reveal my future. Attempting to pass by was unsuccessful. She effectively blocked my way. Knowing how these situations usually go, I took out my wallet and handed her a $20 bill, hoping for a quick resolution. However, grabbing the money, the woman insisted, stating she never takes money without reason and simply asked me to extend my hand. To end this encounter as quickly as possible, I relented and offered her my palm. She carefully examined it, and then, with a mysterious and cautioning tone, warned that I faced great danger like never before. If I could overcome it, I would live to a ripe old age. The woman's words did not resonate in my heart, as I did not value such predictions. Thanking her for the advice, I hurried on inwardly resenting the wasted time. Finally, I arrived at my destination, a building that hardly differed from the typical office structures of the city. It was a four-story construction with a modern facade where glass and metal harmoniously combined, creating an image of strictness and functionality. At the entrance, I was met by a security guard who, as expected, asked for my documents and explained the purpose of my visit. After a brief explanation that I was a participant in the research mission, I was immediately let inside and directed to the elevators, pointing out the necessary floor and office number. Approaching the elevator, I met a woman who was also about to go upstairs. She was of average height, with long golden hair neatly tied back in a ponytail. She wore practical yet stylish clothes. Curiosity and openness to new acquaintances shone in her bright blue eyes. We exchanged glances 
and entered the elevator together, then exited on the fourth floor. To both of our surprises, we needed the same office, number 45. After a brief exchange of surprised looks, we knocked and entered the room. Inside, a small conference room awaited us, with a large table in the middle. Other people were already present. Among them stood out a man in an elegant suit, who approached us with a confident stride and greeted us. He introduced himself as Jeremy Smith, the head of the research mission appointed by the government. After a brief welcome, Jeremy invited everyone to take a seat, taking his place at the head of the table. He began with introductions. First was introduced David Gray, a middle-aged man with a serious and focused look. His appearance exuded strictness and experience, hair starting to gray and insightful eyes. David, a geophysicist by profession, was tasked with analyzing Earth's physical processes in Antarctica. His knowledge and experience were crucial for researching anomalies affecting geological stability and the magnetic field of the region, which could provide the key to understanding the phenomena discovered. Then, the attention of those gathered turned to Michael Harding, the captain of a military unit. His decisive look and physical readiness were immediately noticeable. As a military commander, Michael and his squad of soldiers were responsible for the expedition's safety and logistics in Antarctic conditions. Next was introduced the woman I had met at the elevator, a glaciologist. She specialized in studying glaciers and ice sheets, and her work's importance for the mission was undeniable. Her expert analysis of the glacier's conditions, their movements, and their impact on climate change helped understand the dynamics of anomalies in Antarctica. Finally, Jeremy Smith introduced me, a climatologist who discovered the anomaly. My name is Alexander Hill. My role was to analyze the climatic conditions of Antarctica, study the impact of anomalies on the global climate, and identify potential consequences for the region's ecosystem. After the introductions, Jeremy continued with the meeting's introductory part. He emphasized the mission's main task, clarifying that the temperature anomaly discovered last week initially suggested the possibility of a volcanic eruption. However, some signs did not match the typical manifestations of volcanic activity, indicating the possibility of other causes for the anomaly. That's why it was decided to send our team for a detailed investigation. Jeremy stressed that Antarctica is a harsh place, requiring serious preparation and the ability to overcome difficulties. He announced that the departure was scheduled for tomorrow, giving each of us time to finalize personal matters and prepare for the expedition. Then, the mission leader inquired about the specialized equipment and personal items we would need for work and life in Antarctica. Over the next hour, we discussed the technical aspects and logistics of the upcoming mission, clarifying the list of necessary equipment, from communication devices to scientific instruments and safety equipment. After discussing all details and questions, we said our goodbyes and dispersed, each engrossed in thoughts about the upcoming journey to be undertaken in the unexplored conditions of one of the planet's most mysterious and unpredictable corners. Dawn was already enveloping the city with its first rays when I, having checked for all necessary items, called a taxi and headed to headquarters. Our research group was already gathering there. After exchanging greetings and the latest news, we soon saw a bus approach the headquarters, designated to take us to the airfield. There, a captain and a squad of soldiers, ready to accompany us on this challenging journey, greeted us. In total, there were 20 of us. Upon arriving at the airfield, we found ourselves in front of a mighty Boeing C-17 Globemaster Thurthru, already waiting for us, loaded with special equipment. Among other cargo on board the plane were two Haglund's BV-206 all-terrain vehicles. 
These machines were to ensure our movement across the boundless expanses of Antarctica. The plane's interior was spacious with high ceilings and metallic walls, where foldable seats for the team were securely fastened. Each of us took our place, buckled up, and began preparing for takeoff. Despite its impressive payload capacity and size, the C-17 took off smoothly and confidently, lifting us higher into the sky. Landscapes changed behind the windows, from earthly scenes to endless clouds. After several hours of flight, our plane began to gently descend, approaching the ground. Below lay the magnificent landscape of Chile, a country with a rich history and stunning nature. The plane touched down on the runway of the airfield where a team awaited us for refueling. All processes were streamlined and well-organized to minimize downtime. As soon as the plane stopped, fuel trucks immediately approached. While refueling was underway, part of the team decided to step out to stretch their legs and breathe fresh air. The sky was clear and the air was refreshing. A pleasant break after long hours in the enclosed space of the plane. Shortly after, when the fuel tanks were fully replenished, we returned on board. The team settled in, gearing up for the second part of the flight, the most significant and exciting. The plane, having gained the necessary altitude, headed towards the cold expanses of Antarctica. With each passing hour, it grew colder and whiter outside the windows. Glaciers and snow-covered peaks began to emerge more distinctly, and the sea took on a deep blue hue dotted here and there with icebergs. During the flight, as the icy expanses of Antarctica began to flash by the windows, Emilia, the Antarctica specialist, enthusiastically shared her knowledge with us. She told us that the ice sheet covers 98% of the continent, with some ice reaching heights of 13,000 feet. Her stories came to life with the views of the first icebergs appearing on the horizon. Hearing about the height of the ice, I couldn't help but marvel at the scale and beauty of this place. As we approached McMurdo Station, located on the shore of Ross Island in the Ross Sea, Emilia continued to share interesting facts. She mentioned that due to the height of the ice sheets, airplanes are forced to fly 10,000 feet higher than usual to avoid colliding with icebergs. Antarctic snow, she said, is different from Arctic snow. It is drier and harder, which can pose a danger to airplane tires during landing. The plane began its descent and soon made a landing, a bit of a jolt, but not too severe. When the plane finally stopped and we began to disembark, the first thing that struck me was the deafening silence enveloping the icy expanses and the cold that pierced to the bones. Before us stood McMurdo Station, the largest American research base in Antarctica. It looked like a small town submerged in snow, with numerous buildings interconnected by paths already covered in snow. Some of the buildings were coated in frost, giving them a magical appearance. In the distance, the runway was visible, already being prepared for the next flight, while mountains and glaciers stretched around the perimeter of the station, creating a unique and captivating scene. Looking around and inhaling the cool, fresh air, the three of us stood absorbed by the beauty of the boundless Antarctic expanses. The weather was favorable to us. A clear sky stretched overhead, like a promise of new discoveries. David, taking out a cigarette, lit it and exhaling smoke, said thoughtfully, This place is the last whisper of the earth before the silence of eternity where fate finds its true face in the endless ice. His words made us ponder deeply, adding a special depth to the moment. Soon, the rumble of engines interrupted our contemplation. From the airplane hangar to the street, all-terrain vehicles rolled out, ready for the journey ahead. People from the station approached to help unload our gear. About an hour later, we finished loading everything necessary into the vehicles. 
After a roll call and a brief discussion of the route, we took our seats, ready to depart. In each all-terrain vehicle, designed for 17 people, we sat 10, leaving the rest of the space for cargo. Making ourselves comfortable, we set off. According to our calculations, the journey would take a couple of days, meaning we had to move without delay. It was mid-February, and it was important for us to complete all planned research before the end of the Antarctic summer. Crossing the vast expanse of Antarctica, our expedition slowly but surely moved forward. Around us reigned an immense whiteness, only interrupted by the occasional rocky outcrops and deep cracks in the ice which we carefully avoided or crossed. The sky above us was clear, allowing the sun to cast a soft glow on the snow, making the landscape almost mystical. From time to time, we stopped to check coordinates, look around, or make notes about the terrain and weather conditions. These pauses also gave us all a chance to breathe in the Antarctic air and momentarily feel the silence and majesty of the surrounding nature. Emilia, our glaciologist, occasionally pointed out landscape features, distant glacial formations, snow-covered peaks that stood out on the horizon, and unique snow structures formed by wind and time. She spoke about the processes underlying these phenomena, adding depth to our understanding of the environment around us. As the first day of our journey came to an end, we felt the need for a rest. Despite the constant light of the polar day, fatigue from the trip made itself known. We chose a suitable spot on a flat surface, sheltered from the wind by ice outcrops and quickly set up tents, creating a temporary camp. For dinner, we pulled out thermally resistant packets of frozen food that just needed to be mixed with boiling water. Thanks to modern technology, even in such conditions, we could enjoy a variety of meals. The menu included all the necessary nutrients consisting of hot soup, a meat dish with potatoes and vegetables, as well as high energy bars and hot tea for dessert. After dinner, sharing impressions of the first day's journey and discussing plans for tomorrow, we dispersed to our tents. Attempting to sleep in the eternal light of the polar day, many of us used sleep masks or simply tied a piece of fabric around our heads. Regardless of the precautions, falling asleep in such an unusual place was not easy but fatigue from the long day eventually took over, and each of us gradually drifted into sleep, dreaming of what the next day would bring in this mysterious corner of the world. I woke up a couple of hours later. Lying in the tent for a bit, I decided to go outside. Dressed up, I felt the cool air hit my face. Noticing that David was also awake and sitting at the edge of the camp smoking a cigarette, I approached to keep him company. He looked at me but said nothing, so we sat in silence, watching the snowy plains. Suddenly he broke the silence and said, For some reason, I have a bad feeling. Flicking his cigarette, he continued, I served in Afghanistan, it was a real hell. There I developed a sort of intuition that saved me more than once. It might sound implausible, but I believe in it. Then he looked at me, gauging my reaction. I just nodded. I wasn't one to judge someone's beliefs. I asked him, What do you think could be the danger waiting for us? Danger, he pondered. In principle, we're well prepared, and we can survive a storm or other natural disasters, so I don't even know, but this is a wild place and anything can be expected here. Suddenly, David froze and stood up, noticing something in the distance. Turning in the direction of his gaze, I saw a small, dark gray dot rapidly approaching us. What's that? I asked. Not sure yet, David replied, squinting and trying to make out what it was. The dot grew larger, and we could somewhat discern what it was. At first, it seemed to be a bear but the creature had a strange limping gait. 
It was also clear that this creature was of enormous size and was rapidly approaching us. David reacted instantly, raising the alarm. His shout woke the entire camp and the soldiers immediately rushed out of their tents. Captain Harding ran up to us with a frightened look and asked what happened. We pointed to the approaching creature, after which he rushed into a tent and returned with a rifle and a shotgun. The captain ordered the soldiers to take positions, aiming numerous weapons at the target. David and I stepped back and waited for what would happen next. When the creature got close enough to be seen in detail, it turned out to be a sea lion looking unusual, almost mutant-like, and moving with a strange gallop. The captain ordered everyone to get ready, then stepped forward and started shouting, trying to scare the animal away. However, it did not react and continued running towards us. Then the captain ordered to open fire. Numerous shots were fired, and many bullets hit the creature, causing sprays of blood, but it kept running. Everyone was scared, and the soldiers didn't stop shooting. The captain put down the rifle and took a large shotgun that was lying nearby. Then, aiming at almost point-blank range when the animal almost reached him, he fired. The creature collapsed at his feet from the shot. Everyone froze, trying to comprehend what had happened. David was the first to approach the animal's carcass. Soon, we all surrounded it, trying to figure out what we had encountered. Before us lay a sea lion, but its appearance was far from normal. The creature seemed mutant. Its skin was covered in strange markings and scars, as well as scabs, as if it was diseased. The animal's eyes were unusually large and bloodshot. One of its flippers appeared distorted, which gave it a limping gait. There were areas on its body with unnaturally thickened skin, like armor protecting it from external threats. My God, what happened to it? Emily asked in shock. I'm more curious about what it's doing in the center of the continent and so far from water. David pondered thoughtfully. I glanced at the carcass and a shiver ran through me. The animal looked eerie. We stood there for a while, sharing our speculations. Then the captain ordered everyone to return to their tents and continue resting. He left a sentry and also headed to his tent. But no one could sleep. Soon, we decided to gather and continue on our journey. We left the animal's carcass lying there, only noting its coordinates to return later and take it for research. Continuing our journey, we moved forward under the constant light of the polar day. Despite the sun never setting below the horizon, I felt an anxiety that did not leave me after the encounter with the unusual creature. Approaching our designated location, something unusual happened. Our electronics started to malfunction, and communication was completely disrupted. The navigation system stopped working, indicating a malfunction in orientation. At that moment, we stopped and got out of the all-terrain vehicles to figure out what was happening. Mr. Smith, the head of our mission, turned to the captain with a question. Cap, what's happening? The captain, trying to catch a signal with his satellite phone, replied, The satellite communication unexpectedly cut off, and the navigator stopped working. Something here is causing interference. He continued to walk around, making circles in an attempt to restore the connection. At the captain's suggestion, we decided to move back a bit to check if the communication would return. Mr. Smith agreed with this plan, and we quickly took our seats, heading back along the tracks of our wheels. It only took a few minutes before the captain ordered us to stop. The communication was restored. Getting out of the vehicles, we gathered around the navigator again. David suggested the presence of a magnetic field ahead, which could disrupt our devices. Based on this hypothesis, we roughly determined the direction and distance to our goal. Only a couple of miles left. When we finally reached the place, only an endless snowy plain surrounded us, intersected by a single snow mound. 
Mr. Smith, surveying the area, ordered to set up camp right there. We were to conduct research in this mysterious zone and try to figure out the cause of the malfunctions with our equipment. While the soldiers were setting up the tents, we, the team of researchers, decided to explore the surroundings. Walking around, we found nothing unusual or indicative of the cause of the disruptions in our electronics, which only added to our questions. According to meteorological data, the ice in this area really should not have been preserved even at such thickness. This observation only intensified our perplexity. Soon we began deploying scientific equipment all around our camp. First, we set up a portable meteorological station to monitor real-time weather changes, including temperature, humidity, pressure, and wind speed. This allowed us to compare the local climatic conditions with the standard data. Then, using deep thermometers and a drill, we started studying the ice temperature at different levels, aiming to understand whether it matched its surface temperature and the surrounding air. With ground-penetrating radars, we began scanning the subsurface layers, hoping to detect unusual structures or changes beneath the ice cover that could explain what was happening. By the end of the day, we had a meeting, and I saw puzzled faces around me. It turned out that the readings from all devices were within normal limits, and nothing unusual was found in this place. Although satellite communication still did not work, this led us to a dead end. After a brief discussion, we decided to rest and continue the research tomorrow. After dinner, we, very tired, went to sleep. I was awakened by deep, resonating thuds that seemed to come from the very depths of the earth. Looking around, I saw that not just I, but my companions were also awakened by these unusual sounds. We quickly dressed and exited the tents. The entire camp was on its feet, and anxiety was evident on the faces of all present. Mr. Smith, approaching us, asked with noticeable concern in his voice, What is that sound? We just shook our heads in bewilderment. Something was happening in the depths of the earth. But what exactly? David decided to check personally. He laid a sleeping mat on the ground and pressed his ear against the surface. It doesn't seem like volcanic activity. The sound is too uniform. It's more reminiscent of a heartbeat, he said, making us all exchange puzzled looks. What was hidden in the depths of the Antarctic ice? Emilia added her observations. By my calculations, the depth of the ice here is about 10,000 feet. The sound is deep and muffled, meaning it's coming from the very bottom. The discussion didn't lead us to a definite answer, and Mr. Smith suggested that everyone go to sleep, considering we hadn't slept properly for two days already. As we dispersed to our tents, I tried to fall asleep, but the sound continued to bother me. It seemed to resonate with my body, causing anxiety. Unable to fall asleep, I decided to go outside. There was only one soldier on guard, a precaution after the previous incident. I checked the meteorological station, but found nothing abnormal. Sitting on a portable chair, I began to gaze at the snowy plain. In the distance, a hill was outlined suspiciously unnatural. Armed with a shovel, I headed towards this hill and started digging. The top layer of snow gave way easily, but then came the ice, slowing down my efforts. At some point, I noticed something dark shining through the ice. We were on a plane. There shouldn't be any mountains here. Continuing to dig, I soon discovered a roof made of dark, sturdy metal which looked out of place against the background of ice. I was amazed by my discovery. As I examined the find, a voice came from behind me. What are you doing here? Looking back, I saw the captain, who was looking at the pit I had dug with curiosity. Climbing out of it, 
I noticed other members of the group approaching. When everyone gathered, I told them about what had happened. Everyone nodded in surprise, and upon learning about my find, they froze in shock, then rushed to see it. Armed with shovels, we started clearing the snow, and after about an hour of work, a small structure appeared in front of us resembling a house without windows, with only one massive iron door. We tried to open it, but it was locked. Then one of the soldiers brought a drill and started drilling the lock. Suddenly, he jumped back in fright, dropping the drill. The captain shouted at him, asking what had happened, but he pointed at the door, saying he heard a noise from inside. We all became alarmed. I approached the door and pressed my ear against it. At first it was quiet, but then I heard some rustling, unable to determine exactly what it was. I confirmed that there was something behind the door. The captain, grabbing the drill, said, we won't know until we open the door, and continued drilling. Finally, the lock gave way, and he, grabbing the handle, looked back at us. We froze in anticipation. The soldiers prepared their weapons. The captain quietly and carefully pulled the door towards him, which began to open with a creak and a groan. We tensed up, but looking inside, we found that there was no one there only a small room with an elevator shaft in its center. We cautiously entered, peering into the shaft, which descended into the depths of the earth to an unknown depth. Next to the shaft, I noticed a lever, which Mr. Smith approached and, without hesitation, activated. A deep rumble emanated from the depths to our surprise. The elevator turned out to be operational. Soon, the elevator cabin rose to us. The elevator was spacious, designed to carry about 10 people. Its interior was minimalist. Metal walls, a small control panel with buttons and emergency lighting creating a gloomy atmosphere. After a short discussion, we decided that some of us would descend for exploration while some soldiers would stay on the surface to guard the camp. We stepped into the elevator. Mr. Smith pressed the descent button and the cabin began to slowly descend. With each meter, the light from the upper hatch diminished until it disappeared completely, leaving us in the dim light of emergency lighting. The descent was smooth, but filled with tension. Each of us understood that we were descending into the unknown which could hold anything. The descent lasted quite a long time, and finally the elevator stopped. Darkness surrounded us. Turning on flashlights, we stepped out of the elevator. My first concerned question was about the presence of ventilation at such a depth, as air clearly couldn't penetrate here naturally. However, the local ventilation shafts seemed to be working properly. The air here was surprisingly clean albeit slightly stale. We found ourselves in a corridor. The walls were metallic and covered with a layer of rust indicating long neglect. Drops of condensation hung from the metal due to the humidity of the air. Walking down the corridor, we entered a large room which apparently served as a laboratory. The laboratory was filled with various research apparatus and equipment which looked outdated, but once probably represented cutting-edge technology. Posters with fascist symbols hung on the walls, and papers written in German were scattered on the tables and floor. This suggested that the facility belonged to the authorities of Nazi Germany, meaning that this place was almost a hundred years old. The laboratory looked ravaged, overturned furniture, broken glass equipment and documents scattered everywhere. In one of the corners, we discovered the skeleton of a soldier of the Third Reich. He was leaning against the wall, as if his owner had died waiting for help or in a last desperate attempt to find shelter. This grim find added heavy notes to the atmosphere of our exploration. As we inspected the laboratory, we tried to mentally reconstruct what had happened here many years ago. The papers on the tables possibly contained reports on experiments conducted here. 
and Mr. Smith, picking up one of them, asked if anyone knew German. Only David responded. He took the paper and, shining a flashlight on it, tried to read the contents. Soon he said that it described a report on the condition of the subject, and he suggested that experiments on humans might have been conducted here. We continued our exploration, and then Emily said she found a power lever and asked if she could pull it. After a brief hesitation, we agreed. With a slight tension in the air and a click of the lever, suddenly lights turned on throughout the station, and the ventilation system started making sounds of operation. I was amazed that after so many years of neglect, the systems here were still functioning. Thanks to the illumination, we could now examine everything carefully. Walking along the tables, I found a folder. Opening it, I saw a mystical symbol in the form of a diamond, with a wolf's paw depicted in the center. Calling David over, I asked him to translate what was written. He read aloud the following. The stone negatively affects the body, causing changes within it. Prolonged exposure to its radiation can lead to irreversible transformation, resulting in the subject losing its human appearance, but gaining unprecedented physical strength. Unfortunately, the creature also loses control over itself, making its use on the battlefield problematic. The possibility of deploying it behind enemy lines exists, but is associated with great risks. At the moment, I consider the use of this method impractical. I recommend continuing research, as this object has unlimited potential due to its otherworldly origin. The document also contained various reports and figures, but the main content was truly shocking. What could the Nazis have been developing in this laboratory, and what did they discover here? We summoned Mr. Smith and showed him the document. As he studied it suddenly from above us, from the ceiling, we heard a noise. We all instantly raised our heads, and the soldiers grabbed their weapons. Someone is moving through the shaft, the captain speculated. However, David, with a tone hinting at darker thoughts, added, Perhaps not someone, but something. This thought made all of us tense from the uncertainty of what could be lurking at such depth, deep in the heart of Antarctica. Without wasting time, Mr. Smith suggested continuing our exploration. We headed to the door at the end of the laboratory, which led us to another elevator shaft. Pausing before it, we began discussing whether we should continue our descent. After a short discussion, it was decided that part of our group would stay here, on this level, while the rest would continue descending. Two soldiers were to remain upstairs. They handed us their pistols while keeping their rifles. Pulling the lever again, Mr. Smith called the elevator. After a while, the cabin ascended, and we stepped inside, preparing to continue our journey into the uncharted depths. Tension filled the elevator as each of us was immersed in thoughts about what might await us next. This time the descent into the depths of the earth took much longer than the first. Once again we heard the same sound that had been haunting us. And with each foot we descended. The sound of knocking grew louder and clearer as if calling us to it. When the elevator doors opened our eyes were drawn to a huge cavern. The floor was earthen while the ceiling and walls were made of pure ice. Icicle stalactites hung from the ceiling, creating the impression of a frozen underground palace. Lanterns hung from the ceiling, illuminating the space and making it eerily beautiful. We stood in shock at this sight, but soon our attention was drawn to one thing. In the center of the cavern, drawing attention with its unusual appearance, floated a cube the size of a truck. It seemed incredible, floating in the air, slowly descending and rising as if it were set on an invisible cushion of air. Various wires and devices were scattered around the cube, creating the impression that the cube was part of some larger experiment. However, 
The real discovery was six transparent capsules filled with red transparent liquid, evenly spaced around the cube. Inside these capsules, floating in the liquid, were creatures resembling humans, but partially covered in fur. Their faces were grotesque and elongated, making them look like wolves. The creature's eyes were closed, as if they were in a deep sleep. In rhythm with the pulsation of the cube, they moved slowly up and down in the liquid. We didn't know how to react to this discovery. I looked at my companions. Emily covered her mouth with her hand while David whistled and cursed. What the hell is this? I, too, stood in some kind of trance. It was the moment when your previous world collapses and a new, not better, but terrible one takes its place. I rubbed my eyes and decided to continue inspecting. Approaching the cube, I was able to examine it more closely. It was covered with mysterious symbols executed in a style unlike anything earthly. The symbols shimmered with red light, creating a network of veins. It also emitted the same sound we had heard earlier. With each beat, the veins began to glow brighter, creating the illusion of a beating heart. Suddenly, from behind me, I heard the captain's voice announcing the discovery of a journal. We immediately gathered around it to learn more. The entries in the journal were in German, and David took on the task of translating. It turned out that the cube was discovered in the 1930s, and after that, Hitler sent his scientists to study this object. I remembered reading about how Hitler was obsessed with the supernatural, but I didn't think it would turn out to be true. The journal also contained symbols similar to those on the cube. Many pages were filled with them, and at the end of the entries, there was a combination of six symbols. What happened next and the fate of the scientists remained a mystery. Emily took the journal and carefully studying it approached the cube. She began touching the symbols in the order specified on the last pages of the journal. I noticed this too late and a sinister premonition came over me. I wanted to warn her to stop, but I didn't have time. As soon as Emily touched the last symbol which lit up brightly, the cube began to slowly rotate around its axis, gradually speeding up, emitting sounds resembling a speeding heartbeat, and its veins glowed brightly. We recoiled in horror. The captain noticed huge devices resembling cabinets nearby and called for everyone to take cover behind them. We all hurried there. We didn't know what to expect from this unexpected turn of events. The cube continued to rotate and glow until suddenly there was a small light explosion. We closed our eyes and when we looked again, we saw something before us. A portal formed in front of the cube, emitting red light and covered in beautiful ripples, and the atmosphere in the cavern became tense to the breaking point. The situation intensified when I noticed that the eyes of the creatures in the capsule suddenly opened. It happened so suddenly and filled me with intense fear. I quietly informed my companions about this. We all watched in horror as the capsule's contents began to move and the capsules, like spider webs, cracked. The German soldiers who emerged from the portal also noticed this and seemed to start getting nervous. They aimed their weapons at the capsules and suddenly began shooting. The sound of gunfire and roaring filled the cavern, creating chaos. The creatures in the capsules rushed at the soldiers, tearing them apart. Heart-wrenching screams echoed around us. We watched in shock as the captain, gesturing to snap us out of our stupor, ordered us to head for the exit. We, crouching and trying not to attract attention, slowly moved along the wall toward the elevator shaft. Almost reaching it, I heard a strange sound coming from there. Suddenly, a creature appeared before us, a huge wolf, more like a mutant. It was different from those in the capsules, but bore some resemblance to them. The creature snarled viciously at us, preparing to pounce. 
The captain reacted instantly and fired his gun. The creature dodged, although a couple of bullets hit it, but to our horror it seemed unaffected. It blocked our path to the elevator and lunged at the captain. We opened fire, which fortunately saved him. The creature merely backed off. We helped the captain up and, fending off the creatures, made our way back to our previous hiding spot. Looking back at the battlefield with the Nazis, I noticed with horror that they had been completely wiped out and the creatures stood over their bodies, devouring their flesh. My companions also saw this, and despair washed over us. Hiding behind the devices, we pondered our next move. On one side, the creature by the elevator was attacking us, and on the other, the creatures were feasting on the Nazis' flesh. At that moment, we realized we were caught between two fronts, and a decision needed to be made about our next actions. In this critical moment, adrenaline surged through my body, and I had a single idea. I told everyone to follow me, asking Emily for the journal. Everyone looked at me puzzled, trying to understand what I was planning. I headed toward the cube, quietly creeping along the wall. Glancing back, I saw the others following me. The creatures continued to devour the soldiers, and the massive wolf-like creature stood at the exit, as if its task was to guard it. I approached the cube, which had already stopped and the portal had disappeared. I began entering the same combination that Emily had entered before. When the last symbol lit up, the cube started spinning, attracting the attention of the creatures. I prayed silently for the portal to open faster. We huddled around the cube and suddenly there was a flash. When we opened our eyes, a red portal lay before us. I didn't know what awaited us next, but it was the only way out of the situation. We were trapped thousands of feet below the surface. The creatures slowly moved toward us. I yelled for everyone to jump into the portal. First, with the words, screw you all, David jumped. The others followed suit, disappearing into the portal. Only the captain and I remained, and he opened fire on the creatures, shouting for me to jump. I saw that bullets had no effect on these creatures, and abandoning the journal, I grabbed the captain's jacket and pulled him toward the portal. A flash of light and... Literally a moment after passing through the portal, I found myself in the same cavern, next to my companions. Instantly, I feared that we hadn't escaped, and that the creatures would devour us. But looking around, I realized the situation was different. The cavern was brightly lit, and people in uniforms approached us, among them soldiers with U.S. flag patches. I breathed a sigh of relief, understanding that they were our people. Soon, a man in a lab coat approached us, extremely surprised to see us. He introduced himself and told us what had happened. His words shocked us. It turns out that when we jumped into the portal, the soldiers remaining above ground tried to follow us, but found only two who had stayed in the first laboratory. To their horror, the second elevator wasn't working. Returning to the station and reporting the incident, all forces were mobilized. Restoring the elevator took a long time, and everyone understood that our chances of survival were minimal. After the elevator was restored, creatures were discovered, and the battle with them dragged on for years. Eventually, when the creatures were destroyed, scientists were able to study the cube, found the journal, and, using the combination from it, we appeared from the portal. Listening to this story, we were in shock. David asked how many years had passed since our disappearance. The professor sadly replied, five years. We froze in place, realizing we had been missing for a whole five years. The captain, however, said, but at least we're alive, right? We nodded in agreement. The professor suggested that we go to the surface to be examined by medics. On the way, I asked the professor about the wolf-like creature describing its appearance. He shook his head in confusion. We exchanged worried glances. 
and at that moment, as we approached the elevator shaft, there was a rustling from above. We all froze and looked up, awaiting the unknown.